Thank you. Thank you. Are you having fun this morning? I could tell. I've been sitting out there and then backstage watching it. What an incredible day. How many of you are in this room because you made an intentional decision to get better in several areas of your life starting today? Let me hear you say yes. Yes. I am a real book nerd. I love to read. We got any readers in the house? Yeah. And my favorite thing to read are biographies or stories about influential women and influential men who've made a tremendous difference in their world. I love reading those stories. I recently just finished a great book entitled The Inklings. The Inklings is a wonderful story about a group of writers, poets, artists, and influencers who intentionally gathered together. Now, among this group of the Inklings are two of, in my opinion, the greatest writers of all time, C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien. Yeah. Two of the greatest. Now, I knew that they knew each other before reading this book, but what I did not know is how intentional their relationship was. They were both teaching uh, on the campus of Oxford, and uh, they had been together in several uh, groups, if you will. But one day, Tolkien, who wanted to learn more and get to know Lewis, showed up at Lewis's office on the campus of Oxford. It was a Monday morning, and he knocked on the door, and Lewis opened the door to his office with a beer in his hand. Now, I know many of you in this room want to have a beer on Monday morning. But it wasn't that kind of beer. He's just doing his thing, and so they had their first meeting. And out of that initial meeting, they decided to continue this habit. And so Tolkien would continue to show up, and for quite some time, he would show up on Monday mornings, and they would have this intentional time of visiting. Both have said that many times they would discuss their work. Sometimes they would discuss their classes. They would discuss their lives. And many times just enjoy some body humor, according to Lewis. But it is what happened after that that so fascinated me. They then decided to invite other writers and poets and artists, people who wanted to be on purpose with their work. And so the meetings would take place in a classroom on the campus on a weeknight, many times on a Thursday night. Many times it would happen in Lewis's home or at a pub that still sits near Oxford today. And as the story goes, the meetings would happen, and Lewis would call everybody to attention and say, who's got something they want to share? And it was in those meetings that Lewis began to reveal the early version of Narnia and a talking lion. And would you believe that Tolkien thought that story was too silly? But they sharpened each other. They challenge each other. And there is an intentionality about that story that inspires me, and it should inspire you. There was an intentional act to get around other people of like mind, of like values, of like work for the purpose of making each other better. So today, in the few moments I have to share with you, I'm going to share with you a very simple principle, but a powerful principle, a principle that you could apply to every area of your life. It's not just a professional principle to help you in your professional career. It can help you in your money. It can help you in your relationships. It can help you in your parenting. It can help you in your spiritual walk. The principle is... The proximity principle, which simply says, in order to do what I want to do, I've got to be around people that are doing it and in places where it is happening. Let me broaden it for today. Proximity is about getting around people who are living the way that you want to live. Because it is the people that we hang around and the places we put ourselves in that determine our direction. It's that simple. 
If you don't have opportunity in your life right now to grow, it's because you're not in proximity to the right people and the right places. So we're going to start off with people. If you're following along, we'll hit a few blanks. Here we go. Let's talk about people. Spending time with the right people will change your perspective and improve your position. Spending time with the right people will change your perspective and improve your position. Social psychologist Dr. David McClellan of Harvard found that the people that you habitually associate with determine 95% of your success or failure in life. Now you just think about that for a second. Let that sit. 95% of your success or failure in every area of your life is predicated on the people you spend time with. That's fascinating. How many parents in the room say yes? Yes. As parents, have you ever said, hey, listen, uh, kids, we're going to the high school football game Friday night, and what we'd like you to do is find the losers and the deadbeats underneath the bleachers and hang with them the whole time, then we'll pick you up at the gate when we leave. How many have ever said that? Of course not. As parents, you're mortified. You're almost paranoid. I know I am. Who are my kids hanging out with? I want to try to control that. Why? Because as parents, we instinctively know this. Yet, there is a disconnect when we begin to apply this to our own lives. We just kind of bounce around through life, and we're not very intentional about the people we spend time with and the places that we put ourselves in. So let's talk about, we're going to talk about two people and two places today, just to highlight your growth, because you're here today, and you want to grow in multiple areas. So let's let's look at the producers. Now, I define the producer as a man or a woman who is a high achiever, very simple definition. So when I say producers, in the book, The Proximity Principle, that's what we're talking about. They're just a high achiever. Now, I want you to just think, just for a moment, in your life, Who are some people that you would define as a producer? Do you spend time with them intentionally? Or are they just somebody you see from afar and they're nothing but an acquaintance? So let's talk about why we want to be around producers. Now, the story I opened with, the Inklings, that's an example. That room was full of producers intentionally putting themselves in the room with other producers. Why? I'm going to give you four things that you can get by spending time with producers. This is coffee, this is lunch, this is golf, this is whatever. You find a way to spend time with men and women that you respect. In multiple areas, by the way. You know they've got a great marriage. You long to have a marriage like theirs. You watch how they parent. You say, man, they're doing it right. They're kids. It's obvious. This guy or gal's in my industry or outside of my industry, but they're winning in a very similar position. They're killing it. I need to get around them. Why? First reason, insight. Producers will give you insight into your present and your future. This is just straight up wisdom. That's what we're talking about here when I say insight. They've got experience. They've either walked some miles that you have yet to take on or they're in a very similar situation and they're going to give you some insight, some wisdom into your situation. Number two, they give you best practices. This is just straight up knowledge. We know knowledge is power. So when you're around other producers, they're going to give you their best practices. What works for you? Sometimes we make what we need to know too difficult to find. One of the most powerful questions we can ask that we rarely ask is, will you help me? got to swallow your pride, say, hey, I admire you, I look up to you, I think you can help me in this area, can I buy your coffee or lunch? Now let me just pause here for a moment and point something out. Every day on my show, I have men and women call me and we find out that the reason that they don't ask to sit with somebody like this, a producer, is largely because of fear of being rejected. But let me let you in on a little secret all around the building. When you approach somebody, a high producer, like I just described, and speak to them that way, they are not going to be turned off by that. They are going to feel tremendously valued. 
Who doesn't like to share their opinion? <laughs> exactly. My favorite example is this, of this is the old Tonight Show, because I'm, I'm kind of old school, and I loved when Jay Leno would go out on the streets, right? Uh, jaywalking is what he called it, and they would just take a producer out there and a camera, right, and they'd stick a mic in somebody's face. Jimmy Kimmel does it. It's always going to be a staple of late-night TV and comedy. Why? Because you take a completely ignorant person, put a mic in front of them, and they know they're on TV, all of a sudden they got opinions. <laughs> they don't even know what they're talking about. You've seen it. So here's the point. When you ask that way, they're going to say, yes, absolutely, I, I'm honored. Be happy to do it. Third thing that you're looking for from producers, the resources and rhythms of learning in their life. Resources. What are they watching? What are they reading? Who are they listening to? Where are they learning? And then what's their rhythm look like? What I mean by when I say rhythm is high performers always have a process. They just do. What's their process? It doesn't mean that has to be your process, but you can learn from their process. They've got a plan. High producers are intentional. They know exactly what they're doing, and they know exactly why they're doing it. Finally, connections. Folks, the world revolves around connections. And I'm not talking about networking. I hate that word. How many have been to a networking event and made you feel just gross? Yes. I'll never forget the first time I went to a networking event. I was trying to break into broadcasting. <laughs> uh, I didn't know anybody, and I, I was in Atlanta, Georgia area, and I walked in, and it was a mixer for people wanting to get into broadcasting. And I'll never forget, I walked in the door, and as soon as I walked in, a guy saw me, and he just lit up. Hey, man, how you doing? And he just came over at me, and I was just too naive to realize what was happening. You know what was happening. He's all over me. Inside of 15 seconds, I feel like the most important person in the world. This is a great decision. I'm getting a gig tonight. This guy is interested in me. Until he asked me what I did, and I told him why I was there, and I was just breaking in. And as soon as I said that, I went from being the most interesting person in the world to an invisible person. He started scanning over my right and left shoulder looking for somebody else to attack. I'm not talking about being a vampire when you sit down with these people. And just treating them as though they are the information that you need. I'm talking about making a connection with them. And when you're asking them these questions, you got a pencil and a piece of paper and you're writing it down and you're grateful for it. And when you're done, you say, hey, who else would you recommend that I sit with? What are some things that you think I should do? Is my path the right path? Those kinds of questions. And a learner is very attractive. And so they'll want to help you. All right, let's talk about the second person today. And I think, honestly, this is the most important person of the five people that I write about in the book. And this is the peer. This is the peer. Jim Rohn has famously said, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Yeah. Some of you are going, oh, boy. Yikes. So you're hanging around nines and tens, or you're hanging around threes and fours? Let's talk about two types of peers, and we'll dive deep into one. There's two types of peers. There's the professional peer, and then there's the personal peer. What I mean by professional peer, these are the men and women you spend time with at work. Okay? The average American, by the way, will spend over 90,000 plus hours at work in their lifetime. So the people you see in the hall or in your section of the office, or you see in the lunchroom, you see in the elevator, day in and day out, the team you work with, they are your professional peers. And let's be very clear, most companies in America aren't like Ramsey Solutions. We do a really good job of keeping donkeys out, as Dave likes to say. We got a lot of eagles flying around our hallway. But let's be real. A lot of you right now are going into the office on Monday morning, and you know you're surrounded by a bunch of donkeys. And there's not much you could do about it, but be aware of them, right? Be kind, be respectful. When Bob comes over to complain, tell Bob, you got to take a call. When Susie comes over to gossip, 
Tell Susie, I'm not interested. You got to protect your mind and your heart at work. Sometimes you can't control the professional peers. Well, let's talk about the personal peer. Now, these are people that you are doing life with. And by your nervous laughter all around the building, some of you need to upgrade your peers. Can I hear a yes? yes. Say it like you mean it. Yes. So, what are we looking for? I think there's three really important characteristics of a great peer. Here they are. Number one, the right peer pushes you to be your best. They push you very naturally. Their example makes you want to walk a little taller, walk a little faster, a better bounce in your step because you see them and you go, I like that. I want to be like them. They model the way. Number two, they lift you when you're down. Oh, my goodness, life is tough. If you think life is tough, can I hear a yes? It's tough. We're talking marriage, parenting, career, money today. It's tough. It's tough to win in all those areas at times. We need people who will lift us when we're down. Lift us when we're down. We can call them up and say, hey, i got to tell you something. Uh, I feel like I'm doing everything right at the office. I'm going above and beyond, and I don't feel like I'm getting my opportunity, and I feel like quitting. you got to have somebody on speed dial that you could call, and they say, hey, snap out of it. I'll never forget at least five clear times in my journey. It was a seven-year journey when I started into broadcasting, doing high school football play-by-play on the Internet. Do you know how many people were listening to my first live broadcast? Two. The kid next to me and my wife at home just because she needed to be able to tell me she heard it. No, she's a good lady, but we had three babies. Come on. So I had to do a lot of little, awful, humble things. I'll never forget introducing balloon artists and mimes. When I introduced the mime, he walked on the stage and I wasn't thinking. I went to give him a high five, and he literally stood me up like this. It's humiliating stuff. That particular day that I'm talking about, I'm driving home, been hosting this local festival in our local town all day just to try to make some connections. And I'd been there all day from 12 to 9, introducing people that nobody cared about to a bunch of empty lawn chairs. I I was the most invisible person on the planet. And hour after hour, I began to get discouraged and discouraged and discouraged. I was driving home that night, and I was truly going, Ken, you might be delusional, man. This, this, This broadcasting thing is, it's almost impossible, and the road is too long, and I don't know if you've got what it takes. I don't know if you can stand another day of just getting your pride beat completely out of you. So it was after 9 o'clock, and I knew there was one guy, one of my mentors and dear friends that I could call. And he's sitting right over there, Les Parrot. And I'm in my driveway on the verge of tears, just going, what am I doing? And I called Les, and he answered the phone, and I told him all the stuff I just told you. And he said, hey, I'm telling you, you're not delusional. You'll get there. Stay with it. It wasn't a long conversation, but that's all I needed to hear. you got to have some peers that when you're at your lowest and you are fighting the voice of fear and doubt and they're squeezing in on you from both shoulders and you just want to quit to make the fear and doubt shut up, you better have somebody on speed dial, a peer that will lift you. Finally, the third thing you're looking for to peer, somebody who will hold you accountable to your goals. Somebody who will hold you accountable. You're telling these people, hey, this is what I'm going for. This is the destination, and I need you to keep me accountable on the journey. They'll look at you and go, hey, how you doing? Are you reading what you said you'd read? Are you cutting the sugar? 
Are you taking your wife out on intentional dates? Are you eating ramen noodles? Are you eating rice and beans? I should have said that one. Let me tell you the kind of person you need in your life. You need a bill. Let me tell you about my bill. So Dave, uh, as he opened his up this morning, he talked about his marathon experience, and then he went into the half marathons, and he's done several. And uh, so it was about two years ago uh, that Dave decided that he was going to challenge most of our company uh, to run the Nashville Half Marathon. And I'll never forget, I was in a meeting with Dave, um, and I, I remember Christy Wright and Chris Hogan and Anthony O'Neill and Rachel Cruz, we all just happened to be in this one meeting with Dave, and um, we're sitting there and we're all just kind of having, you know, some idle chat before we got started, and I was sitting across the table from Dave, and I remember Dave saying to, uh, to uh, Christy, he's like, uh, Christy, I'm going to run the half marathon, you got to run, and Christy's like, yeah, and Christy loves to run, right? And she's like, yeah, and then everybody's kind of talking, I really wasn't paying attention, and then he looked at me, and I knew what was coming. And Dave goes, Coleman, you going to run? And I went, absolutely not. I hate to run. Can I just confess this? I despise running. I like to work out. I enjoy exercise. I hate to run. In fact, there's a bunch of runners in the room. Let me hear from you. I love you all, but I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know what's wrong with you, and you're running from something. No normal person goes, hey, I'm going to go run six miles today by myself and pound the pavement. So Dave looked at me and he kind of gave me that sly grin, basically saying, we'll see. So fast forward a few weeks later, we're in staff meeting. And uh, he's up there and he's challenging everybody in the room to run the half marathon. And uh, he's like, we got great participation. I want to see higher participations for a good cause. And we're going to raise some money to help a lot of people in Nashville. We're going to show great team spirit. It's going to be great. And I'm kind of sitting in the back, you know, listening. And he goes, and Coleman's going to run. Dave, I didn't say. So everybody in the section is looking at me like, way to go, Ken. So on the way home that night, I called my best pal, Bill Hampton, who's done triathlons and marathons. I said, Bill, I just told him that story I told you. I said, look, man, we're 12 weeks out. I am not a runner, um, and I got to get ready for this thing. And I said, the only way I'm going to do this is if, A, you train me because you'll hold me accountable, and, B, I've got to have a stretch goal. That's the only way I'm going to do something that I'm miserable at. You give me a goal, I don't care how miserable it is, if it's better on the other side, I'm in. I'm that way, but i got to have a stretch. So he said, we'll do it. It's great. Now, Bill is psychotic when it comes to running. You understand what I'm saying? He's nuts. So he comes up with this very detailed plan, and so we started it. And so we'll fast forward to uh, we're about six weeks out, and we're going to start moving into these long runs. He's been building me up quickly, six days of training a week, one off day. So now we're going to switch, and I have Saturdays off, and on Sunday, I'm going to do my first long run, and it's over an hour. I think it was about an hour and 15 minutes, as I recall. And I'd never run that long in my life. In fact, the longest run I had done up to that point was 45 minutes. And so I had a watch on me that Bill could track me. Remember that accountability thing? So he knew where I was. So I'm in the middle of this run. I'm actually, I'm approaching the middle point. And at the middle part, he had designed the run so that I would take the hardest hill at the middle of the run. And so I made it up the hill, but I'm dying. I'm dying physically. I'm dying mentally. I'm dying emotionally. I want to die. <laughs> and I'll never forget, I get to the top of that hill. I crest it. And some of you who aren't great runners know what I'm talking about. The amino acids are exploding out of me. I'm about to choke on my own saliva. It's ugly. And I get there and I go, okay, great. Now I've got the downhill, but I'm just dragging cinder blocks. And I'm coming down the hill and I see about a mile down the road, there's a bend and I see a white suburban come screeching around the corner. And a guy hops out really quick, and he gets on the hood, and he sits there like this. And I'm dying, as you know, so I'm not paying attention. As I get closer and closer, I see it's Bill. About the time I see it's Bill, Bill looks up and sees me, and this is what happens. You got it, Coleman. Go, baby. Looking good. Woo! Yeah, you got it. You got it. You got it. And at first, I'm like, huh? <laughs> and as I got closer, I went from this to this. <laughs> oh, 
What happened? In one moment, a peer pushed me. He lifted me, and he held me accountable. He knew I was going to be there at the half point. He knew it was going to be the toughest part of the run, and he was there. And I had a physical transformation. Literally, I finished strong. I had a better pace on the back half of the run. That's not an accident. It works like that in your life, in your marriage, in your parenting, in your career, getting out of debt, saving. You got to have that peer. Let's talk about two places. A place to learn. A place to learn. This is the intentional act of always learning. Dave said this earlier, and he's absolutely right. You go do the research on successful men and women in any industry, and if there's one commonality, it is this. They are constantly learning. New techniques to train, new techniques on eating, new techniques of the mind, new techniques on leading. The greatest leaders are learners. I have been incredibly blessed in my career to get to sit in a room with men and women I don't belong in the room with doing interviews. That's how I got started. And at Ramsey Solutions, my first three years, I, I did interviews with some of the greats. I'll never forget years ago, I was interviewing Coach K. This is a basketball town. Coach K is the most successful uh, college basketball coach in history as it relates to wins. And after the end of the interview, I looked at Coach, and we were just talking, and I said, hey, I didn't ask you this in the interview, and I'm just curious. What do you do even now at this point after winning three national championships? What do you do to continue to grow? He said, oh, Ken, I'm so glad you asked me that. He said, every offseason, I'll call a young coach or I'll just show up to a young coach's practice unannounced and take notes and ask them about their offense, ask them about their defense, something I saw in the season. He's constantly learning. So I'll give you a couple examples of a place to learn. This is very simple. Today is an example of a place to learn. You showed up at the SMART conference. You're going to learn a lot today. You have to be intentional to put yourself in a place to learn because our mental diet is everything. What we put in our heads affects the way we think, and the way we think affects the way we act. It's not the other way around. You can't act your way into change. You have to change your thinking. So, podcasts, YouTube, books, webinars, having coffee at lunch with producers, all of those are places to learn. The final place. In 2019, I think this may be the most important place that we all pay attention to today. And that's a place of rest. How many of you got really uncomfortable with that moment of silence? A lot of you. Why? We're not used to it. It's weird. It's awkward. It's a broadcasting technique. Broadcasters use it well. You could be going fast, high intonation, and then when you pause for a moment, the audience leans in. Now, some of you, I won't make you show your hand. We're kind of hoping that I was melting down and you were going to get to watch it. But the intentional place of rest, what do I mean by that? The quieting of your head and your heart. Quieting your head and your heart. We have so much coming at us, folks. You know this. 24-hour TV we're at a computer all day long, emails interrupting you, texts interrupting you, social media interrupting you. We are in the middle of a time in history where we are under constant onslaught of information. This is what your world sounds like. White noise all the time. What is white noise? We use it in our offices to dim other people's conversations out, can't hear it. I use a white noise machine in my room because now it's the only thing my brain hears. So I don't hear some moron slamming his door at 2 a.m. in the hotel. That's our natural rhythm. 
No wonder 70% of Americans are unhappy at work. They don't even know if they're connected to the work. It's just a thing all the time. How are you going to be all that God created you to be if you can't hear from your heart? And the way you begin to hear from your heart is to quiet the brain. So it's the intentional quieting of the head and heart. Specifically, quiet time each day. Start your morning in quiet. Whether it's in scripture or prayer or meditation, start in a quiet space. Control what your first thought is. Your first thought in dictates your whole day. Control the last thought in your head. Get quiet before bedtime. And in a place where you can actually hear your brain and heart communicate to you. It's amazing what happens when you can just sit quiet for even 15 minutes. So I want you to get in a rhythm of intentional rest and intentional quiet. What's your daily routine? What's your weekly routine? What's your monthly routine? Throw sabbaticals into this. This isn't just vacation time. When you're on vacation, go. Get quiet. My favorite thing to do on vacation is to go to the beach two hours before the rest of my family and sit right at the edge of the water and just be quiet. I talk for a living. It's really good for me when I can listen to my head and heart and I focus on the right thoughts. And then it fills me back up so that I can pour myself out on the radio every day. Now, let me talk about burnout and why I'm talking about a place of rest. Everybody in this room has heard about burnout. My goodness gracious, I'm so sick of hearing about burnout. I'm on a crusade about burnout, so I'm about ready to get fired up. The World Health Organization just recently has said that burnout is a medical condition. That's ridiculous. It's an excuse to start giving people pills for stuff that could be solved in the heart. Yes, clap. There is no such thing as burnout, and I need you to help me spread the word. So the next time you think it and say it, correct yourself, and you hear somebody else say it, correct them and say, there's no such thing as burnout. Because the moment you burn out is the moment that you die. I'm not going to apologize for my faith. But the creator gave us a spirit. And when we die, the spirit leaves the body. The soul leaves. And that's when you're burned out. The flame has been extinguished. But you are alive in this room. And that means, by definition, you cannot be burned out. But let me tell you what you're feeling is very real. It's very real. What you feel is a symptom. But let's get to the source of the symptom. Let's not give pills to treat a symptom. Let's get to the heart. And it's called buildup. I'm going to give you five causes of buildup. Write them down. They're in your book. Follow along. Here we go. The number one cause of buildup on the heart is there's no connection to your work. You don't love it. You're good at it, but it doesn't matter to you. Listen to me, people all around the room. Anxiety, suicide, depression, it's all around us. And let me tell you the slippery slope as it relates to your work. If you don't believe that your work matters to you, the slippery slope is you begin to think that your work doesn't matter to anyone else. And here's where it gets scary. Once you believe that your work doesn't matter to anybody else, you start to believe that you don't matter. The number one cause of suicide, folks, is a lack of hope. Number two reason for buildup on the heart. You're in a toxic work environment. This is very simple. You got poor leaders culture of gossip, backbiting. They don't love their people. They don't value their people. You work with people that are just toxic. And you can be square in the middle of your sweet spot. 
doing something you were created to do. But if you're going in every day with toxic people, you don't want to show up. Number three reason for buildup, you're overwhelmed. The minute you get in the car at your house and put the seatbelt on, you start thinking about your day and you feel like the water's here. I got any people that are overwhelmed? Say yes. Number four, you're underappreciated. We know from HR studies that men and women would rather be publicly recognized in front of their peers and by their leaders than they would get a raise. That's right. Don't get me started. If you start amen and I won't stop. Why? Because we all want to know that we matter. We, don't, we want to know that people see us. That's why. Number five, you're bored. The fifth cause of buildup, which leads to these feelings of burnout, is that you're just bored. There's no challenge. We are human beings that were created to contribute, to do work for the common good. And when we're bored and there's no challenge, you can start to feel burnout. So those are the five causes of build up on the heart. And here's what I mean. If we went around the room and did this experiment, if you put your hand on your heart right now, you can feel your heart beating. But if you kept putting on jacket after jacket after jacket, and then I told you the same thing, you know where your heart is, you'd put it right where it was, but you wouldn't feel it beat anymore. Why? It's been covered up. Layer upon layer upon layer of those five causes of buildup will make you feel like, I'm burned out, I gotta quit, I gotta start over. So what do we do? We need to make sure we know the causes, and when we know the cause, we go, hey, if I don't have passion for my work, I got to find work that fires up my soul that I was created to do. If I'm a, yeah, amen, come on, somebody. You got one life. Why in the world would you work just for happy hour on Friday? If you're in a toxic workplace, go to your leader. Say, we got toxic people in here. Are you aware of it? Fix it. If they don't fix it, say, I'm out. You get the point. I got to close. Why is the intentionality of proximity around the right people in the right places so important? Because this is really simple. Catch this, folks. Proximity to the right people and to the right places positions me where I need to be so that I can learn and grow and do and connect and keep progressing in every area of my life. It positions me where I need to be. And then it propels me to where I want to be. All around the room, hear me. If it's been a while since you've caught an opportunity and you're not growing, examine one thing today. Are you in the right place? Because if you're not in the right place, the right time cannot and will not happen. And why does it matter? Because I believe that every man and woman on this planet was created to fill a unique role by our creator. Psalm 139, 13, David writes, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Talent, passion, what I love to do most. Excuse me, what I do best and what I love to do most. He put it together. Paul writes in Ephesians 2.10, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You were created for a reason, and it's not selfish ambition. It is selfless ambition. Because as Dave Ramsey reminds our team every Monday morning, we are blessed to be a blessing. It's not about you. Somebody out there in this world needs you to be you. So, you matter. You have what it takes. You've been a great audience. Press on. Wow. Keep it going for Ken Coleman. Wow.
Ken, that was a powerful message. I felt it. All of you taking notes diligently. We've got a few standing up here. Thank you, sir. Now, before you rush off, I just wanted to say our team is so proud of Ken and the work that you've been doing with the Ken Coleman Show, uh, the number one best-selling book, The Proximity Principle. I love the way that you're helping people because it is literally life-changing and life-giving. So we got a glimpse of what's in Ken's book today from his teaching, but give people a little bit of a deeper dive as to how this book can help them get to where they want to go. Well, what we know is, is that the two greatest causes to keep people from doing what they know they're supposed to do is simply fear and doubt. Fear that I'm going to fail, doubt that I have what it takes, doubt that I still have time. The ship has sailed. And so there, consequently, George, is a tremendous myth that only a few fortunate souls are lucky enough to get to the top of the mountain. And so what we've done in the proximity principle is break it down. The formula you heard today, the right people plus the right places equals opportunity. And that's what everybody longs for. It's why everybody comes to this country. One word, opportunity, right? The American dream is alive and well. So what we've done is, very simply, there's five people in the book, archetypes. You heard a few today. Five places. And then there's practices in the back section that say, all right, when I'm around the right people, when I'm in the right places, this is what you do to maximize those opportunities. And essentially what we've done, folks, is demystify the journey to your Mount Everest, what you were created to do. I love that. Isn't he amazing? Give it up one more time for hey, Ken Coleman. Book. Hey, let's do this. Oh, you want to give away yeah. a book? Do we got? Thank you. Thank you. Do we have, uh, I just want to give this away to somebody who's got a college kid that's about ready to hit the real world coming up. This, this guy right here. Come on down real quick. Come on. There it is. Give him a big hand. This is going to uh, set your kid free. Oh, we got two guys. This is awkward. Here's the deal. Come up to my book signing in the second break, and we'll get you a book. Sorry about that. Appreciate you. Thank you, everybody. I love it. Give it up one more time for Ken Coleman. Thanks, Ken.